Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today, guys, this is a special session because we're at the family mastermind and I just happened to bump into somebody that is worthy of you to check out. Mr. Steve Richards, thank you so much, man. Yeah, man, happy to be here. Appreciate Excited. you. And also taking the invitation at short notice. Yes. Uh, he got stolen from the room, basically. <laughs> um, and he's the first one out of a few that we're gonna do today. So let's start with who you are, like where you come from. Yeah, man, so I was born in Indiana, still live in Indiana. And um, I just grew up in the cornfields, went to a very small school and uh, wound up as I went to college, I went to a college called Ball State, but I got a business degree. Had a lot of fun in college, actually. But, All right. Uh, when I got out, I went into tech consulting, and that was in the late 90s. Okay. It was, pretty, it was like a lot of dot-com stuff. Um, if any of you guys are older, you'll know there was this thing called Y2K. Yeah. And so... Um, now, were you afraid of the Y2K, like... In the year 2000, we're gonna, our computers are going to go... Literally, like, I don't know if I was afraid of it, but I know that like our clients were. And so right. we had massive projects that actually didn't matter because everyone thought everything... And then nothing ha bad happened. Right. But it was an interesting time because there was a... At the time, I didn't know it, there was a recession that happened. Um, the tech boom, the recession came out of the, the dot-com bust. Yep. And then behind that, 9-11 happened, which changed the world, obviously, forever. Yep. And um, as an entrepreneur type person who was still in corporate America at the time, I didn't even realize I was still getting, I was advancing through tech consulting and got into the sales end of it. And so where, where a lot of my friends were losing jobs, I was able to keep advancing because I had the sales and a technical background. Right. But um, yeah, that's really where I hit the business world. So I did that for seven or eight years. And then um, I had a tech startup that, that um, that I didn't make any money on, I didn't lose any money. I got I got out scot-free, but we did a lot of uh, what I would call a dog and pony to raise venture capital. Right. And so I got to be around a lot of cool people trying to raise money and uh, write business plans, and, and it was all bullshit. I mean, it was crazy. It was literally like we had to show how we were going to have a be a be a billion dollar right. industry or part of a billion. You had to sell the dream. Yeah, we're like this is what we think we can do, but the venture capitalists say. It needs to be a billion dollar industry. You need to have a hundred million within five years. And you start there and you reverse engineer it. And it's like, we're gonna hire 40 people a month. I mean, we're like 20 some year old kids and just right. making shit up is crazy. Um, but that was really cool. I feel like I got my street MBA, even though I had an undergrad in business, but I really learned a lot. And- um, How much money were you guys able to raise? Uh, just, it's only in the hundreds of thousands. Like, okay. We needed 1.5 million and wow. nobody wanted to talk to us. It was, it was crazy because we were a little too big for angel investors and we were way too small for the real tech and we got some doors opened up. So there's a thing some of you guys may have heard of called BNI, mm -hmm. Business Networking International. Yep. Ivan Meisner is the founder. He was on our board wow. of this company. And uh, we had a couple other guys, one of Mark Cuban's good friends from college who lives in Indiana, um, was on our board and they opened up a lot of doors. And what was interesting was as an entrepreneur, I didn't know any better. I just listened to what they told me, but we would walk in and they would say, hey, if you didn't know, the internet doesn't work. It didn't work, you can't make money on it. I mean, wow. literally in like 2000, all these failed tech companies, they were like, the internet was a flash in the pan, it's just brochureware, it's now never Now we can't live without it. Unbelievable. If we don't have internet, you, literally we'll start going through withdrawals, like shaking and shit, you know? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm worried, because I'm like, what if I get stuck here? I gotta order food, I need to order a car, I need to like, you know, I buy stuff and on it's Amazon. all on this thing on your phone. You know, yeah, it's man. like it's crazy. phones became computers now. Yeah. I, I was surprised when this morning uh, Josiah talked about 90% of their web traffic comes through mobile num uh, mobile uh, devices. Yeah. So I imagine, I mean, I would say that during that time, 99% of those guys were right. Yeah. This is what was going to happen. They were just way ahead of the curve. But I had a flip phone back then. I mean, right. smartphones weren't out yet, right? Yeah, they didn't exist. Um, so yeah, the, the interesting thing was, at the time, our business was a lot like LinkedIn. And so one thing that I learned, and, and look at LinkedIn now, right? And, and it was a little bit of a version of, the, of 
not Facebook at all, but it was a social networking site before anyone knew it. In fact, today when they brought that up, Friendster yep. was our competitor. Oh, wow. Like that, I knew who that was because we were in that space. Wow. And uh, what's interesting is our revenue model was based on classmates.com, which is almost not even a thing anymore. Um, and so when we went out to the market, I would never forget that, you gotta edit this out, dude. My, oh, it's my alarm's going off. <laughs> That's yeah. annoying. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll never forget this. There's a guy in Indiana who sold a company to Salesforce. It's the biggest private, it's the biggest sale of a tech company in Indiana ever. It's called, um, it was called Exact Target, and he got bought by Salesforce for two billion. Wow. That's, that's a B. And um, I had a meeting with him about 10 years prior to them selling, maybe 15 years almost. And um, I sat down with him and he saw some momentum we had and he actually called us. He's like, I want to talk to you guys. But we explained what we were doing and he was like, listen, bro, my salespeople spend their whole life curating their contacts. There's no way they're going to put them on the internet for everybody to see. They're not going to openly share their contacts. And I'm, I, I was like, man, this guy's smart. He's probably right. right. And then I'm with all these venture capitalists and they're like, listen, the internet didn't work. You're not going to have a revenue model where subscribers pay money. Well, wow. right. And, um, it, so I, I believed him and I got out of it and it's interesting. I'm not bitter about it at all. It's literally why I got into real estate. So I just, I floundered around for a few years trying to figure out what I want to do. And, um, just decided that I was going to buy some rental properties. So what do you do right after you left the tech? world like I know you, you I wasn't full-time in that startup so I had day jobs um, so there was an overlap where I, I ran the, uh, I was the director of IT for a financial services company and I started taking two-hour lunches to like go to closings right rental properties and right. so I overlapped so you started your real estate career while you had a job, yep. you, you were a W-2 guy I was that guy with a good income yeah good credit all right what time is me. this So 2003, 2004. Okay. Yep. So, um, and I love that because I'm not a I'm not a, a, a W-2 hater. I'm not. Like I was in corporate for many years, and I tell people, you have a good job, you got good income, get as many rentals as you can, get as much experience as you can, you know, go load up on credit cards because credit cards will give you when credit when you don't need it. Yeah. Banks will love to throw money at you when you don't need it. And he's usually the guy that's got a W-2 because they, they're stable. They're, they have that paycheck yep. coming in, right? And I started the same way. I, I, I had a job and I was buying rental properties. And Harmony lenders were like, just sign, sign and, and, and take it and rehab it, right? Yeah. And yeah, it took me years. You know, I was, a, I think I was a part-timer for maybe eight years. While I had a job, I accumulated a lot of rentals and, and, nice. and experience, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, how to deal with contractors, have money stolen uh, from contractors, which yeah. I'm pretty sure you, uh, you probably had some of that school as well, right? Yeah, always. So you started getting, so how do you, what, what sparked that interest in you while you had a, a good paying job to get into real estate? Like, Well, I had an entrepreneurial fire because I'm just that person anyway. Right. And... Quite frankly, man. Will you, will you be the guy signing up for MLMs and things like that? I, yeah, dude. Absolutely. Done, everything. <laughs> I everything, love it. man. I everything. love it, yeah. So, so what's interesting is um, I had this entrepreneurial fire in my belly, but I didn't understand it. But when I was doing the tech consulting, I, it was very fortunate um, to come out of college when I did and get the kind of jobs I did, um, which, by the way, was because of the fraternity I was in. Right. So networking. I, I didn't even want for a job when I, right. I already knew where I had a job when I graduated and it's very similar to the masterminds and the, why we're here. Right. Doors are opened by people, right? It's a common theme in my life that I was in a great fraternity. It afforded me a lot of opportunities. I got some good jobs right away. What's interesting is these dot-com startups that I was working with, I just got to see guys with like business plans on the back of a nap napkin and they would get five million bucks, you know? Wow. And So I saw that and I realized like, oh, you can just start something. It wasn't foreign to me because I watched people do it for years, right. starting these tech startups. Um, and so one thing I want to circle back to, what's interesting is 
I didn't understand at the time, and I don't know that I would do it any different, but that W-2 thing, I was dying. Mm -hmm. Every time I advanced in my job, and I'm gonna, this is a theme I'll circle back to in a minute with you, because I think this will be good for everybody watching. Right. Every time I got a promotion, I hated it more. So the more as, responsibility. As it, as it built, I made more money. Well, I almost liked the responsibility and I liked the challenge. Right. But I hated it more, like what I was doing. I wanted to get away more. So the mm. better and bigger it got, the more I didn't want it. Right. And um, I was ready to do almost anything after that tech startup and I got out of it because it wasn't right um, for me at the time. And um, it was more about the partnerships, which was another learning lesson. It wasn't about the idea. Right. The idea was killer. LinkedIn does it. Right. It works. They're billion dollar companies. So it wasn't about the idea. It was about the execution was off and the partnerships were off. Mm. And um, I didn't know it at the time. We thought our idea was bad, but I realized it didn't take off because we didn't have the synergy of the people. Got it. And so one thing I want to circle back, it's interesting if anybody's watching this that, that has a job. I coach a lot of guys. I'm like, look, you're like, I can't wait to go full time in real estate. You're literally asking to bury yourself into another job. Yes. By the way, it's a shitty job. A shitty boss with no paycheck. A hundred percent. No guarantee check. Which you no guarantee checks. And so if you can keep your day job while you learn to run real estate, then you have the option of never having to work inside of it, only on it. Yep. Um, that's a tremendous thing. Now, if you don't burn the bridges, bridges or the boats yep. and go full time, you may never actually have the the inspiration and oomph to go do it, right? Well, and you know, every not everybody's got the same goals, right? Yeah. So I, I got friends that are incorporated, right? And you ask them, hey man, so what's your retirement goal? I don't know, I gotta I wanna have two million in the bank. Or I wanna have whatever. That there everybody has some certain number that they 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 yeah. wanna achieve when supposedly they retire. I don't see myself ever retiring number one. Like I don't think that exists in my book. Yeah. But anyhow, for those guys that think of retirement, um, they say, I want $2 million. That's not that hard. That's about five to ten properties that you buy today. In 20 years, they're going to be worth that much. Just because if you, look, if you want to see what's happening today, go look back 20 to 30 years ago. Yeah. A property that's worth today three hundred grand. how much it used to cost back then, right? Yeah. So you buy them today, they're going to appreciate in value in time. And it's not that hard to get five to 10 properties, rent them out, you know, collect an income while you still have a job. Yeah. Um, and, and that makes you a real estate investor, which by the way, now you get a ton of deductions on your, I, I'm not giving any advice here for uh, taxes or anything like that, but um, I remember when I was in corporate, so I was on the highest tax bracket because of my income. I was making good money and my friends, we started talking about complaining about taxes. I'm paying X amount of dollars in tax. You know, the, yeah. that's the, the talk of the, the where, where we had coffee and all yeah. that, right? So I'm like, you guys are dumb as hell. And they're like, what? All you guys gotta do is buy some, a few rentals, rehab them, and now you get all sort, sorts of tax deductions and you write these things off and you get a good CPA that knows what they're doing and you know they know how to segregate cost and all that and you're good. So how much you paying taxes? I said, bro, I'm about 11 percent, and they're like, what? No freaking way, dude! I'm like 36 percent. We're at the highest one. Yeah. These are all guys making two, three, four hundred grand a year. Yeah. And I was like, yep. You know, for me, it's kind of like a necessary evil. Like, you know, I, I had to keep buying these things so I can just, you know, uh, write it, write it all off, mm -hmm. and have a legitimate business behind it. Yeah. And literally that's how a bunch of those guys got started yeah. in, in, in real estate because they wanted to save money on taxes by having, you know, because I said, guys, you're going to pay the money to either Uncle Sam or you put it on properties. You choose where you want it to go. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that you're mentioning that because um, that's exactly how I started. The same way. I had a job, W-2. I loved my job, by the way. I didn't hate it. I hated the politics. That was different. Yeah. All the backstabbing, you know. Steven, what the fuck? You know, like, yeah. I'm better than Steve. You know, like, that competition that's dirty. I didn't like it. And, yeah. and when I got laid off, I just said, I'm going to do real estate full time. Uh, I'm, I was still young. So I took a chance then. But how was your journey buying rentals and while well, you had a job? Yeah, so um, 
interesting for me was I was more focused on flips. On flips. While I had a day job. Building capital. How, how bad is how bad is that idea? So well, it's not bad, but it's like but and it's by, at that at that time, 2003, 2004. Man, well, the market was great. Yeah, it was but, on the way up. But having a day job and trying to flip houses when you're the GC, you're dealing with, you know, the funding and contractors the don't show bids up. and the contractors. Buying and materials. I'm, and I'm yeah. working with the realtors because we didn't, you know, I didn't have a brokerage yet. I didn't have anything. I didn't, and um, so that that was that was tough, but it was interesting. So we ramped up pretty quickly to doing five rehabs at a wow. time. And um, while you had a job. Yeah. And, and and as soon as we hit that, and we bought a couple duplexes and a couple other rentals, so we were at like, you know, five projects going at a time and four or five rentals. And 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 then I don't suggest this for everybody, but like, I made ten to twenty grand every time I bought a house. Right. Because I would just overfinance it. Right. Yeah. You were you were front. collecting money at closing. And so, I was like, I'm out. I quit. And I was interested. I had a three year old daughter at the time. My wife was staying home. She had quit her job when we had our daughter. And um, the month after I quit, we found out we were pregnant with twins. Wow. And so I found out that you are actually uninsurable if you have a dependent who's pregnant. Well, yeah, of course. You, I can't get new insurance. You cannot so get I had to new stay insurance. Out. So I was paying like two grand a month for Cobra. For Cobra, yeah. And wow. uh, my wife's freaking out and she's like, you just quit your job and we're getting ready to have twins and we already have this three-year-old. And like, it, it was an interesting time but I got into real estate as an investment. And so when I made the position, I just realized I could make money at it. I never thought it was a business. Right. And um, I only spent, it was six to eight months to ramp up to what we did. We we're doing five projects. We just went in because I understood it. I had a friend come to me at the gym where we played basketball all the time. And he was like, dude, I just dropped about 40 grand going to see these, some of these old time, Chris Kirshner, Ron LeGrand. Right. And he had all these stacks of three ring binders with CDs in them. Right. And he's like, read this. And it was like, get the deed and all this, you know what I mean? It's all creative. And it was like, he's like, look, you can run an ad in the paper and says, I'll pay you 15% for your money. You can run an ad in the paper that says like, um, if you want to buy a house, you just have to have a down payment. And then you just go to the seller, they'll just turn the deed over to you and you get the person with the deposit, you know, it was just no money down real estate, right? And I was like, this can't even be True, possible. Yeah. So we didn't even do the creative. That's what got my interest. And so he and I went into business together because he said my dad was going to do this with me. And he's not. And so I invested in this and I travel. I was supposed to be the business of like paying for the money and getting the training, but he was going to actually like do stuff. Do you have time to make calls? He was going to execute, yeah. And so that's how it started. And um, wow. it was only six or eight months of having a day job and doing that. So I didn't have years of toiling and I was making enough money that, and I had the ability to leave my job because of what was coming in from the real estate already. And so it really wasn't that hard of a transition for me. I mean, I will say this, I was just talking to my kids about this the other day. Um, there, were, there was a time where they would, my wife and daughter go to bed. And so from like nine, 10 o'clock at night till 12, one in the morning, I'm comping properties, I'm making scopes of work. And then I would sleep and around three or four, um, I would always wake up, like couldn't sleep, I was excited. Yeah, your brain like, is just going at it while you're in bed. I'd sleep three or four hours and if something woke me up, so I'd wake up and I'd spend at least two or three hours every morning before I had to go to work. Wow. Doing that stuff and then I went and worked. So you only slept three to four hours a night? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, for like six months, eight months. And so, uh, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. But you just do, like, I would never do that now. No way in hell. No, no, like, no. Sleep that, is so important, but I look back on it. I didn't think twice about it because I knew. And you were young too, right? Yeah. You were then, probably in your 20s. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I was 30. I was 29. Testosterone level is through the roof and you got a lot of energy and and you got that hustler mentality to where I was like, you know what? I'm going to put in 18 hour days. I was the same way, dude. I did the same exact thing. Although I needed my six to eight hours. Like I, I had to sleep that much. Now, yeah, luckily for me, I didn't have to clock in or out. So if I showed up in my office at noon, they didn't even miss a bit. My, my boss was in, in, in the UK. That's cool. So, and, and my building was a corporate building, which most people travel. 
So nobody's in your business, literally nobody. Yeah, I was at a company where everybody was in everybody's business. No, yeah. no, in, in ours, and, you know, and, and at some point I had a little team going around and they wanted to be in my business, but uh, they knew what I was doing. Like, I, and I would tell them, I was like, guys, you guys, go, you guys need to go flip a house or something, you know, because I would never let anybody, like, I'll treat them just like I was treated. So I was like, guys, you guys can come in and out as you please. You're making good money. Be smart about it, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, invest and do this and do that. These jobs are not safe. That I always knew. I always knew I, I was on the verge of, and the higher I got in that business, man, I could all, all me, almost see it coming from, from 100 miles away. Yeah. And, um, but anyhow, I, I, and it's interesting, when I got laid off, so my wife was pregnant. She was pregnant maybe five or six months. And I'm thinking about the insurance thing now and Cobra and all that. So they did give me a little settlement package so I could walk away with some money, which yeah. was great on their end. They didn't have to do that, but uh, they did. And uh, I remember going through the paperwork and I saw the insurance portion of it. And they were paying only for 30 days of insurance. Then after that, I would roll into Cobra. So I negotiated with the HR manager. I said, hey man, I know this is not of your business and my boss's business, or this is a numbers game in this company and all that. Can you give me insurance for another six months? He's like, what? My wife is pregnant right now. So if, you, if I roll into Cobra next month, I gotta, the money you're giving me, that thing is gonna go to Cobra. Cause it, you know, it, it, yeah. for my Cobra was like three grand a month. Yeah. Cause it's based on income and all that. Yeah. And he's like, let me see what I can do. So he literally, he got up out of the table where they were doing the exit interview as they call it. And he found Neil, Neil was my boss at the time. Shout out to Neil, I love that guy. Uh, Neil was in Australia actually, and he's like, hey man, Ricardo, he's, he's got wife pregnant and, and he's asking for six months worth of coverage to make sure the delivery is done and baby's got a little bit of insurance while he figured things out. Done. So you don't get what you don't ask for, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was, I'm very blessed and, and happy that they did that for me. But when I, as I drove off that building, it was a Friday, it was August 16th or 15th. I'll never forget that day. Uh, I had a nice Mercedes Benz, lived in a million dollar home. My expenses a month were like 20 some thousand dollars because I live like a rich guy. Yeah. And I'm thinking I'll never be in this position in my life ever again. I'm 30, I was 36 at the time, I'm 40, about to be 44. Uh, so this was, this was not long ago. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know what, man, I, I, I'm just going to figure something out. So I had two choices. One was MLM, because I've done them before. And another one was real estate, because I've already done a lot of flips. And at that time, I had three rehabs that were out of budget. So I was like you. I was doing already multiple rehabs and, yeah. you know, flips and rentals. Um, so anyhow, they were all out of budget. I was bleeding cash. Uh, but yeah. it was an interesting situation because now I don't have a job. Insurance is going to end at some point. My wife started having contractions when she found out. She's like, you got what? Laid off? Because ah. now she, she knows. Like, hey, we're going to yeah. run out of money at some point. So talking about those experiences, right? Once you went full time as a real estate investor, what was driving you or what was the main motivator for you to say, I'm going to make this work? Like, because, yeah, it could be in your family and all that, right? But a lot of people, they will get scared to death if, yeah. they're fi if, if they find themselves in a situation like that. They go into analysis paralysis. Yeah. And they're wondering, do I get another job or do I take a leap of faith on myself and, and go make this work? How was that transition for you? Um, interesting. It's a good question. Um, I think maybe I was a little different than some folks in the respects that because of what I went through trying with that tech startup, I already had a belief in myself that I could start something that was way bigger than me. And so um, we've talked about that here. I think it came up on day one when Pat Precourt was talking about it, but the belief creates an expectation. Yeah. And all the work I did on that startup the way that I've, I've learned this, and uh, shout out to Richard Root, by the way, because he taught me this literally like 17 years ago wow. when, when he was my coach, and he's here too. Yep. Habits 
create an attitude. And an attitude creates a belief, and a belief creates an expectation. Wow. He called him Habes. And I had already had the habit of working my ass off to build something. So I had an attitude that I was going to do it, which created a belief. And so when I went into it, I just expected it to work. I had an expectation. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't betting on doubt. What if? Yeah. You were like, fuck it, this is going to work one way or, or another one. Yeah, it's like the, the way I see it now is like, I say this all the time, all these different avenues I see it, it's appropriate here. Like, maybe don't bet on me for this one thing I'm doing right now, but don't ever bet against me. Right. In general. Like, don't right. bet against me. I like that you say that because a lot of times I, when um, I'm coaching somebody, I, I sense there's doubt, right? Mm -hmm. And I just had this phone call on Saturday, actually, with two guys. Shout out to these two guys. They, they see the video. They know who they are. I'm not going to mention names. But I said at the end of the call, I mean, they cried. They, they, they were going through a lot of stuff, right? Literally crying. Like, and I'm like, guys, I'm going to help you out. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to fix your stuff, right? By the way, I am betting on you. So this, is, this better works. Because I'm not, I don't bet on losers. And I can see their demeanor change. Like, what? You're betting on us? Yeah. Because they see themselves as losers because they've been losing. I mean, we all are losers at some point, you know? Yeah. But then that changes at the moment you change that demeanor to where you say, you know what? I'm bet I bet on myself. I'll figure this out. I'll make it work. And if it doesn't work, I'll figure a way out how to make it work. Yeah. So, literally, I just went through that on Saturday, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy I asked you this question, because you guys watching this video, guys, or listening to this podcast, that's literally, Steve just gave you the recipe for success on you. That's the recipe for success on somebody. Will you fail? Absolutely. How many times did you fail? All the time. I still do. You still do, right? You still Well, I see failure as feedback. It, there is no failure. There's just feedback, negative feedback, like this didn't work. Yep. And the only failure that we all know is if you quit. Right. You know, that's the only way you lose. Hey, so, so a failure is more like a setback, but in my mind, I enjoy it. And this is like some deep shit that we probably don't have time to get into today. Maybe we'll have to do another one on this, but I'm so deep into the psychology. Like I care more about the mental health of my students. I care more about the, the psychology of our clients. Like. My brain has been wrapped around this part of it so long, but um, that there is just this um, there's this thing that goes on in our head that filters our whole life, right? Like, like literally, you see something, and because of the way your brain works, you attach different emotions to right. it. And like a kid, a different kid that was brought up in a different house can see something that excites them, and it might be something that scares the shit out of you. Right. But you said people will get scared. With I see it's an opportunity to get laid off. It was the best thing that ever happened to you, right? Absolutely. There was and a blessing in this guy. And so what's interesting is um, it's this perspective. And so for me, I literally have reprogrammed over the years to when there's a problem, I'm excited. I never get mad. I don't get frustrated. It's yeah. an opportunity to fix something. And when I fix something, I, know I have a system for doing it where I figure out what caused or allowed the thing, right? And you create the process so it won't happen anymore. So when you can think that way guys like when you can understand like stuff's happening for us not to us and these are all opportunities and there is no failure there's only feedback all all these cliche kind of things they're just true right my old business partner used to bring it up all the time danny shout out to dennis um my friend my brother from another mother um he we will go we'll be going through some shit like I don't know, a property didn't close and we needed that money. That, yeah. you know, you know how that, you need payroll, you need, you know, and, and then, oh, yep. closing didn't happen. And then I'll be like, oh, okay. And, and I'll just pivot it to, okay, this didn't bring me what I needed. Where do I go get what I need, right? And I can see him building up to where he's about to blow up. And I said, hey, dude, what's going on? Like, relax. We just gotta make something else work. He's like, dude, but you know, and I was yeah. like, man, just keep your keep your focus, keep your calm. You know, we don't we don't get anything by getting mad, by crying, by getting pissed off at each other, yeah. or or to the title company, or the seller, or the buyer. 
None of that solves our problems. What solves our problems is being able to focus and, and, and be calm about it and say, okay, if this did, didn't work, what am I going to go find that's going to work for me in my situation right now, right? And I can see why you are where you are today is because your mindset, um, and, and I agree with you 100%, mindset is number one. Yeah. It's not the systems, it's not the, the gadgets or, or the, the know-how, or uh, it's the mindset. Yeah, stuff. It's the mindset, yeah. number one. I, I eat it, I love for, I live for that. Um, I have morning routines, I, I read books like, like a junkie now, which I used to hate it, by the way. Reading a book for me, hell no, no way. Now it's like, which one is the next one I'm gonna read, right? Yeah. So, so, okay, so, but let's fast track. You got rentals. Um, when is it that you got into wholesaling? And, and, cause you were flipping, right? Yep. And then you did rentals. Yep. But you are a wholesaler today and also a trainer. Yeah. How so, do you find wholesaling? Yeah, so we, um, we pivoted with the market as the market started shifting. So we saw it in early in 2006, we saw things starting to shift in the spring because we would always go heavy in projects in the winter um, those first few years we were doing this and then have them all ready to hit the market in the spring. And so we were carrying, well, we got nervous and we saw some things. So we started trying to change a little bit of what we were doing. But by 2007, when we went into the spring market, we had 15 houses for sale. And we shifted all those to a rent to own immediately because we realized that the sales were slowing down days on market, like a lot of price drops were happening on these. And so the problem is we had over improved them because we made them like top dollar flip ready, which I wouldn't do with a rent to own, right? Uh, other problem is we were focused on getting the best equity return, you know, gap of what we had in it versus what it would sell for. Right. Um, not how good would the cash flow be. So when we flipped them, it was interesting because we went from 15 houses that were costing me money to hold them with all the utilities right. turned on and I had realtors. It's that twenty plus thousand dollars. And it was bleeding us monthly to literally within six weeks, I collected a five to ten thousand dollar deposit on all of them. Gone. And then they started giving me like rent money and then they took over the utilities. It flipped our cash situation like crazy. Wow. So um, what was awesome is all of a sudden we got, you know, 20, 30 grand or more just that was coming in in chunks. And then we got all these rents coming in that's more than covering our holding costs, but just barely because they weren't designed to cash flow well. Right. But we're like, oh, this is something. So we started realizing we should do this at a higher scale. We set up a pretty big line of credit. And then we started buying where we would buy them in, in groups of three or four at a time. We'd go to our line of credit because that's, that's about how much room we had on there. Um, we'd get them fixed up. We'd put a tenant buyer in there. And then we just went to the bank and we're like, look, here's the inspection on it. Here's the rehab. Here's our, all our numbers. Here's the tenant buyer. You know, here's the lease, all that. And they would bundle those up and put them into loans together and roll them off. And we'd just, we were rolling. Um, back, you know, that's in 2000 seven and eight and we started um, running into an issue in 2008 when everything went to shit we were buying cheaper houses at the time because when we realized if we're going to do this model there's actually a better area of town we went into C properties we were mostly flipping B right or low A so now we got look so so now we got into this game where we could buy more where we we're literally paying half as much for the house but the rent was two-thirds Right, so we're getting, got a hundred grand in a house that we thought we would sell for 140, that we get a thousand bucks a month rent, but we can go down here and buy a house, two houses for the 50 each. Right. And we're getting 750 rent, so I'm getting 15, right? And I'm right. diversified. I thought it was really smart. What I didn't realize is the clientele changes from B to C. Completely different animal. And so at the same time, the banks were limiting. They're like, hey, we got to slow down. It's 2008. Um, no tragic, like we did have a call and like, hey, can you pay this off? We had a call on a line and things. We're like, nope. We had advice from a good uh, mentor. He's like, just here's how you respond. Where do I mail the keys? That's how you respond to that. When they ask for the money wow. back, you say, where do I mail the keys? Because they don't want the house. No, they don't want the house. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we'll work with you guys. So we were able to not have any of that, those crazy things happen during that time. But um, that really led us into um, wholesaling because 
we were just stockpiling our own properties with rent to owns at the time. I didn't even think about all I was looking for the equity paydays when someone got their credit fixed. Right. Because back then, um, all you needed was 12 on time payments and it would be called a land contract refi and there was a system behind it. Right. And so that was another big learning lesson if there's another nugget to take out of this is there's been three or four times where my business model is based on the banking industry and it's based on what the retail market sales market is, home buyers, or what banks are willing to loan and or um, willing to refi me. And then it was also based on um, that rent to own piece. We were like, look, I don't care if they're a train wreck. I just need them to make 12 payments and they'll right. get financed. And so we didn't, we didn't understand underwriting. And so I learned I was out of control because the bank quit giving me money and the retail buyers went away. And then the tenant buyers, once they became, when rent to own in 2008, when the subprime market fell out, literally all of our rent to owns became rent to rent. <laughs> they were rents forever because those people were they never going to get a loan. They couldn't qualify for a loan. The, the guidelines so, changed. Yeah. And so we were to, so, and I pivoted at that point into wholesaling because I'm like, look, this isn't dependent on anybody. It doesn't even matter if the market changes because we're picking them and selling them so quick. It can't change that fast. We don't need any money from a bank to do it. And I don't care. Like there's always investor buyers, no matter what cycle we're in. Mm -hmm. And so that was when we made that big pivot. That was um, really in t going into 2010, 2011. And to kind of fast forward, you know, we started running bus tours with a couple of mm -hmm. RIAs and I started a RIA of my own. And we got into wholesaling, but I was really bad at building teams back then, which ironically, I just did a presentation on, right. on, on how to build great teams. Um, so instead of being able to build a good sales team to wholesale, I couldn't dispose and wow. I didn't acquire well. I bought off wholesalers. Yes. But I started buying off wholesalers and then because I couldn't sell as is, I had all these real people coming to us and they're like, well, why don't you fix it up for me? And then I'll buy it. And then they're like, well, you manage all your rentals because now fast forward at that point in time, I had, I don't know, 60 or 70 rentals of my own and I was managing them in house and I was a shitty manager, but I didn't care that my books were loose. Right. I didn't care that people sat for two months without paying before they got evicted. Like, right. I didn't care that like maintenance, deferred maintenance, there was preventative costs are like a 10th of letting a problem go and right. fixing it later. You know, it's like, I didn't understand all that and when we started managing for other people and rehabbing for other people, be, just because I could, which is another lesson, just because you can doesn't mean you should in this business. Doesn't mean you should, yep. So once we started doing that, I fell into turnkey and we did five to 600 of those over the next three, four, five years. Wow. And um, I woke up one day and I hated life, man. Like it wasn't even about, I'm a creative strategy guy. We, we were managing 350 rentals for hundred investors. Most of them were in Israel, California and Hawaii. And every day was 15 people that wanted to just bitch at me about yep. something. And I had 20 rehabs at a time going on. I had a construction company, a brokerage, an investment company, and a property management company. And, and literally like I had no integrator, operator, partner in all of it. Wow. I was a visionary running four companies that none of them were built well. And um, in 2013, I, um, was reading a book called Starts With Why, Simon Sinek, and it changed my, changed my brain about how I provide value to the world. And then I read, I read in 2013, I read EOS, I read Traction, and I read it three times. And then I made my managers read it. And if anybody knows that book, you, sh you should get it if you're building a business. But literally chapter one is core values and we couldn't get out of it because everything that they knew our clients would resonate with, I hated. And they're like, well, what do you want, Steve? And I'm like, this is what I care about. And they're like, our clients aren't going to care. And I, was, and I flippantly said one day at lunch, I'm like, guys, if we have been trying so hard for me to care about what our clients want and vice versa, like the only way I see around this is literally if we quit managing properties and quit doing construction, like it's a joke. Cause it's like 90% yeah. of what we did. And a year later I'm, I ended up shutting everything down. It was painful, but I closed all that and got out of all of it. And that was the second evolution of wholesaling. At the time, I was like, nope. I tried to wholesale before and I wound up in turnkey because I couldn't build a team to do it. I kept taking the easy route. It's easier to do. It's easier to buy. Well, yeah, it's, 
when you're doing turkey, it's easy to buy off a wholesaler than the seller, right? Yep. There's no marketing costs. And the other thing is, it's easier to sell a house that's fixed up and rent it out. Yep. It doesn't take anything to do that. Okay. The problem is now you got to manage it. And you're accountable to the construction warranties. And, and you got loans and liabilities and, and all of these things, right? Yeah. And so I've, I've flipped about 12, 1,300 properties now. And the first five or 600 were a job and 700. And the last five, 600 have been as a business. And so somewhere around 2014, 2015, figured out what I wanted to be when I grow up. I, I was spending six figures a year, uh, multiple six figures a year on masterminds, coaching. I had a nurse practitioner. I had a guitar coach I would go see with my daughter. I had oh, golf wow. lessons with my son. I had a life coach. I had a therapist. Um, I mean, I went to a special doctor at that time. I had a trainer at the gym. I was like, I was literally in sight. I was, I was trying to invest in anything I could to make myself better and figure out who I was and what I want to be. And I did that for a couple of years. And um, what do you think was the uh, the uh, the aha moment when you said, "Oh, what was the EOS the one thing that allowed you to see what you wanted and you didn't want, or, or there, was that was it a coach, or was was it a situation like when did you get clarity?" Man, it's kind of all of it, but I would say that the epiphany was that book. I mean, it wasn't that book. It was the concept that book put in front of me of yeah. my core values because I got my head out of like, what are we doing? We're a rehabber, we're this, we're this, the thing. I got my head back to like, what's the reason? Like, what do I want to do? Yeah, like, what's the why? Like, and yeah. I really knew in my heart I wasn't, I wasn't fulfilling my purpose. And so I hated what we built. Similarly to I was excelling in the corporate world and I didn't hate it, but I didn't want it. Right. And then I went and built something I didn't want again because I built whatever all my clients wanted and I built what other people built. And I, you were chasing somebody else's vision and dream, yeah, most, not yours necessarily. Most people, most people don't know what they want. I'm sure you'd agree with that. A hundred percent. And they're ninety nine percent of my students. They, they they don't even know what they want. No. And they're running away from something, not towards something. Right. Because once you know what you want, you can run towards it. That's it. And all all your decisions become so much easier when you know who you are and where you're headed. 100%. Because all this other shit happens. And I've got a very strict, like, like this might be a good thing to throw in for people that, that feel like they suffer from shiny object syndrome. Look, everyone. Have you read this. that book, The One Thing? Yeah. Love it, dude. <laughs> yeah. All, you said, what's the thing? Like, I'm like, I could read 10, 10 books or the reason I changed my mind. I was right. one of them. Uh, Traction was another. Starts with why was another. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is the shiny object syndrome isn't something we need to get rid of. It's the only reason we're in real estate, dude. Absolutely. It's the only reason our lives are the way they are. 100%. But the problem is we need a filter and a process. We need, and that all starts with knowing what you want. And so when the shiny object pops up, because we're good at seeing them, because they're not really shiny. Sometimes they're, no one else sees it. Right. But like visionary people see stuff and it catches your eye. And I said this earlier, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something but in this business it's hard because there's a million ways but like I realize now I've got to look at it and I've got to be able to vet it out I have counsel I have an attorney and a lawyer and my integrator operator partners look at everything I do now right um, I talk to my wife about everything now like I process it through my people and then I ask myself if they think it's a good idea and then I look at it is this going to get me closer to what I really want and who I want to be and then I'll dive in and then I decide when I'm going to do it. Now, someday, maybe, or at a very specific time in the future. But I have a process. Your process might be different. But the point is, without shiny object syndrome, man, the world sucks. Because entrepreneurs don't start all the companies. No, start. and we need, we need people that are chasing rabbits all the time. Because otherwise, so, uh, there's not going to be solutions to challenges, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't have guys like us that suffer from some of that. Uh, solving problems. Literally. It's like our strength, dude, but it's also our weakness when it goes untapped. When we don't, when we don't govern it, it becomes our all of us. Yeah, and for the, and for a lot of people, they go the majority of their life not governing the shiny object syndrome, and that's why they they're it's like they're running without direction, right? Yeah. I turned down an opportunity today actually because I'm so focused on what I'm doing. The guy comes to me and says, hey, man, it would be great if you joined this. I was like, brother, not for me. It's not in my plan. It's not on my core values. 
I don't want to be licensed. I don't want to do this. There's so many reasons I can tell you why I don't want to join that. I'm not. I'm not trying to be a dick or anything like that. But really, yeah. I I, I can't. Like. Well, that's so powerful, dude. Because whenever you guys say yes to one thing, you're saying no to everything else at that point in time. Yes. And when you say no to something, you're able to say yes to anything. So yep. I'll say that again. When you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to everything else at that point in time. And when you say no to something, you have the option of saying yes to anything you want. That's right. And so when you jump on something because you can't help yourself, almost inevitably, there's something better coming down the pipeline. Absolutely. And you 100%. just got to be patient. A hundred percent. So, man, we got to do a repeat of this. Uh, uh, I think uh, we, we got a lot more to talk about uh, in when it comes to your journey, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, so um, I'm 47, man, so I'm on Facebook, dude. Okay, I'm you're like, on Facebook? I'm not on Instagram. I'm, I'm, I'm the classic, you know. Do you, do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, we, a little bit. Okay. We do. So uh, two, two businesses, if, you're, if people are interested, one is called the CEO Nation. Yep. And so the CEO Nation.com, the CEO Nation.com, um, slash links has all my social media links and my blog my uh podcast all kinds of stuff on okay. it. so that's probably the best place to find me and then um yeah man like through you because i'll do another one of these that's how they're gonna find let's me. do it let's do it man i appreciate so much your time yeah, steve this was a great podcast guys by the way don't forget to hit share like and subscribe the real estate entrepreneurs event is coming to houston texas june 24th and 25th i hope to see you there I'll see you then. Bye.